She is a national chairperson of the, Canadian, of the Council of Canadians, which is a citizen advisory organization with members and chapters across Canada. She is also co-founder of the Blue Planet Project, which works internationally for the right to water. Maud chairs the board of Washington-based Food and Water Watch and is also an executive member of the San Francisco-based International Forum on Globalization and a counselor with the Hamburg-based World Future Council. She is the recipient of 10 honorary doctorates as well as many awards, including the 2005 Wright Livelihood Award, and it's been known as the sort of the alternate, alternative Nobel Prize, the Citation for Lifetime Achievement at the 2008 Canadian Environment Award, and the 2009 Earth Day Canada Outstanding Environmental Achievement Award. In 2008-2009, she served as senior advisor on water to the 63rd President of the United Nations General Assembly. She is also the best-selling author or co-author, talk about a slacker, only 16 books, yes. including the international bestseller Blue Covenant, The Global Water Crisis and the Coming Battle for the Right to Water. Maud has addressed our assemblies in the past, and I can't express to you how fortunate we are to have on the side of the public interest an activist like Maud. I don't know how many times you've circled this globe, Maud, but it's on every time it's been on our behalf, and I can't thank you enough. So please join me in welcoming Maud Barlow, activist extraordinaire. Wow. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, everyone at the front table. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, UNA. I look out in this room, and I know why we still have public health care in this province and this country, and it's because of you. And it's also because of the work that we've done together. Uh, we've been very involved uh, in our organization, the Council of Canadians, and Heather, you'll be glad to know we just decided at our, we had our 25th uh, annual general meeting this past weekend. We're 25 years old. Uh, and we decided that we want to up our campaign on health care again because we're so concerned about the, the death of a thousand cuts that's being allowed by the Harper government and promoted by governments across the country. We also work very closely with Friends of Medicare. And I know that you guys are part of, of that wonderful coalition, that network, as, is, as you are with um, Public Interest Alberta. Um, and our good friends and colleagues there. So this is a really important network that we've built in this country. I remember that Stephen Harper said before he was Prime Minister that he would kill the Canada Health Act if he could. Now, he doesn't have the, the guts to do that. He'd never, he'd never have the courage to take it on directly because he knows full well that people in Canada don't want this. So what he's doing is allowing many things. One, of course, is the as I say, the death of a thousand cuts through private services. He's also promoting this whole discussion on sustainability, and when you hear the questions of sustainability, you know how it goes, an aging population, we can't afford the costs and so on. Don't listen to that, you know that's just code word for privatization. And we know exactly where the costs are rising, and it has nothing to do with the good quality public health care that Canadians are receiving from their hospitals and their doctors. Um, and they're also now, and you should know about this, it's not the topic of today, but I just want to put it on the table. There's something called the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, which is the most dangerous trade agreement that's ever come across our country, is being negotiated now between Canada and Europe. And you say, oh, but isn't it better in Europe than in the US? Don't they have better standards and so on? Doesn't matter. This is an agreement that for the very first time will open up what's called subnational procurement to, to transnational corporations uh, because NAFTA and the WTO only apply to federal spending. 
uh, but they've always wanted to get at that next level, which is provincial, municipal, hospitals, schools, universities, water systems, electrical utilities, all of the things that we spend our public money on and actually is the mother load of, of public spending. It's between 100 and $200 billion in Canada and it's what these corporations have wanted to get their hands on. Your government, our government in Ottawa, is actually negotiating with uh, negotiators who have stated they will not sign an agreement that does not open the door to all of those subnational areas. At least starting with procurement, so if there's a new hospital to be built or a new um, diagnostic testing center or whatever, it all has to be opened up to bids to the lowest bidder from European service companies. And because NAFTA has a clause called Most Favored Nation, we, whatever we give to a new set of countries in a new agreement, we have to give to our NAFTA partners as well. They're also going to be talking about an agreement to increase the time frame around pharmaceuticals so that we're going to be even further away from being able to have um, affordable drugs. So it's a very, very serious issue, and although I'm here and I'll stop talking about that now, I want to talk to you briefly about water. It is really important that we face together this next very bad Canada European Union CETA, it's called, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, and Heather and I and you guys all together have fought and won, I might add, a, a great number of these terrible investment and trade agreements, and this is the next one that we have to deal with together. But today I'm here to talk to you about something that's related, but a little bit different, than that is that there's a new assault in this province on the whole notion of water as a human right and a public trust. And it's very similar to the healthcare fight. <clears throat> very, very similar to the notion that we believe in this room that you should have access to quality healthcare without having to be denied because you cannot pay for it. But coming to a community near you, if we don't stop the planned takeover, a corporate takeover of Alberta's water is going to be a similar introduction of the right to water only if you can pay. Now here is the, just for a second, to step out into the global situation because I want to make the connection between healthcare and, and water. We know that if you don't have access to clean water, it, it is probably the most important health factor of them all. 85% um, of the beds, hospital beds in the global south are occupied by people who are there who would not be there if they had been able to afford clean, affordable, safe water. Waterborne diseases kill more children every single day than HIV, AIDS, war, and malaria put together. It's the number one killer of children. It's the num number one killer of adults. I spoke to a, a conference of young uh, frontline healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and so on, who were all going into international development a while ago, and they were all keen to get in and work on HIV AIDS and set up clinics and so on, and I said, if you can help us solve the clean water problem in the global south, you will do more uh, than anything else you could ever do in terms of, of dealing with the healthcare issue. We know for sure that one of the reasons that cancer rates are rising in First Nations communities in Canada is because of the in inaccessibility of clean water um, for the people there. And we certainly know the, the statistics from Fort Chippewan and the cancer clusters that we're so concerned about now. So I want to make the connection that when I'm talking about water, I'm also talking about health care. The right to clean, accessible water is a fundamental right, but it's also a fundamental health right. The story, very briefly, is this. The world is running out of clean water. Now, you, you know, you may read the odd story about how bad it is, and you may think it's just in the global south, but I cannot strongly enough tell you here as I stand that what we learned in grade six, that every, you know, the, you can't destroy water, that there's this finite hydrologic cycle and it goes around and around and around and you can't destroy it, and therefore you can't hurt water, it just goes back into the system. Your teachers weren't lying, but they were wrong. What we didn't know then, and I think some of them are still teaching it, so we don't, what some of them don't know now, is that the demand for fresh water in our world is outstripping supply by an amazing amount. Um, there's a brand new study that says that in just 20 years, demand in the world will outstrip supply by 40%. 
Now that may sound like just a number until you start to understand the suffering that's taking place now, the suffering that's going to take place in the future as millions and millions and millions of people, more pe millions of people, are cut off from their access to clean water and sanitation. Um, and so we, we need to make this the, the, the understanding that as we are running out of water, and we're talking about northern China, all of India, all of Pakistan, 22 countries in India, um, every country in the Middle East, all around the Mediterranean, Southern Europe, uh, Australia, uh, Mexico City sinking on itself, the southwest of the United States. These are all places that are not just experiencing cyclical drought, and this is very uh, important to understand, but where we are overtaxing the water table. So we're pulling that water from rivers, we're pulling it from lakes, we're pulling it from aquifers, and we're either using it to grow crops or whatever that we export away, or we're uh, sending it to big cities where we dump it in the ocean as waste, or we're growing crops inappropriately in deserts and destroying whole entire water tables. The world is running out of clean, accessible water, and the, the, the sanitation crisis is growing. Come back here to Canada, to come back here to Alberta, we grew up with what I call the myth of abundance, that we have so much water that we could never possibly run out. And this is as much of a lie here as it is anywhere in the world. And of all the parts of Canada that are in the most crisis, this province is it. This is ground zero of the water crisis here. We have many, many factors here. We have uh, a limited supply in, in the first place. We have climate change, which is going to dramatically increase the drought conditions and cause evaporation. We have melting glaciers. Rivers like the Bow River are entirely dependent on glacier water for um, replenishment. When the glaciers are gone, the Bow River will be gone. We have mining destruction. We have energy destruction of our water. We have something called uh, virtual water trade, which is where you, you use your water to produce grain or livestock or whatever that you then ship out of the country. With only 2% of the country's water supply, Alberta is, is growing 66% of the crops that require irrigation. So you're using this diminishing supply of water to irrigate crops that generally are shipped away. And one way and another, we are siphoning off that water. Um, there's anywhere from 50 to 90% of the water takings for agriculture and irrigation from uh, the Bow River, for instance, and from you know, anywhere where there's intensive uh, water is actually leaving the, the river system so that these rivers are, are, are literally beginning to, to dry up. And I cannot say it as strongly as I, I, I can't find str strong enough words to say that this province is going to face a water crisis really soon. I call it not the perfect storm, but the perfect drought. Now, some people in government know this, and so they've been doing a lot of studying and so what they have decided to do is set Alberta on a path of water markets. Around the world, there's a huge dispute as to what path to take in a world where demand is outstripping supply so dramatically. And don't forget, we're going to add another 3 billion people to the planet. So that there tend to be two paths. One path says that water is a commons. It's a public trust. It's a human right. It doesn't belong to anyone. It belongs to all the people of that community. It belongs to future generations. And so needs to be protected in law, needs to be protected in the ecosystem as well. And therefore, you have to put a, a sliding scale of, of, of values on who's going to have access and why. So you have to do planning and thinking. The other is the exact opposite. The other says, let the market take it. The market will, will determine everything. It will, be, it will determine who gets water. It will move to a more efficient use of that water. And um, it, will, it will increase industry, and it will increase profits, and that can only be a good thing.